done. Okay, yeah. um, welcome back. And it's my pleasure to introduce my friend, Juliana Tomashko from Smith College, who's going to talk to us about K times N Springer fibers and webs. Juliana, thank you. All right, thank you everyone. Um, and uh, thank you for, for listening, for participating from everywhere. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about K by N Springer fibers. Uh, so these are Springer fibers associated to a uh, particular partition, in this case, a uh, partition into a sort of K by N rectangle. Um, and I will also be talking about webs. Uh, and having said that, I, I don't think uh, uh, many of those words are going to show up at the very beginning of this talk. Um, for some, uh, for some uh, so what I'm going to start with instead, um, so these Springer fibers uh, sit inside the flag variety. Um, and I'm just going to say uh, what, what, what we've heard in other, other talks. Uh, the flag variety is G mod B. I'll be sitting inside type A, so thinking about GLN. Um, and thinking about upper triangular matrices uh, from IB. Uh, and as Rebecca said, each flag can be thought of as a collection of nested subspaces in CN. Uh, and if you wanted to, you could pick a coset representative. There are different conventions, um, but I'm gonna pick uh, the convention that says you've got some matrix uh, with zeros to the right and below a fixed permutation. Um, so for instance, here is some particular nested subspace aligned uh, contained in a plane, contained in a three-dimensional space. This, this here is C3, um, and also a matrix uh, where you see the permutation matrix, um, just the columns are uh, precisely those vectors um, that I've put into the subspaces. And then we have certain entries um, uh, that are allowed to be non-zero if they are both to the left and above one of the permutation ones. So, uh, uh, so, um, I, there is a torus uh, in this particular space. There's a torus of invertible diagonal matrices um, that is acting on the flag variety by multiplication. The fixed points are permutation flags. Um, and uh, we can use this torus to partition the flag variety into Schubert cells. Um, uh, when we do this, uh, the Schubert cells are, uh, they sort of collect all of the flags that have a fixed permutation matrix um, uh, and any particular uh, free entry both to the left and above the ones of the permutation. Um, so for instance, the uh, flag that we had in the previous slide uh, would be an element of this particular Schubert cell um, indexed by that particular permutation. Uh, so uh, I'm going to just say a little bit about uh, the sort of general general geometry and uh, um, uh, geometric properties of the flag variety. So the flag variety is partitioned into these cells. Um, these cells form a CW decomposition, uh, and the uh, closures of these cells induce a cohomology basis uh, for the uh, flag variety. So as Rebecca said, those are the Schubert classes. Um, and uh, I'm going to say uh, another couple of things. Um, so, uh, so there's questions about local geometry. Um, uh, oh, Tony, I am uh, horribly afraid that those noises might be uh, my children in the background. Um, so, uh, if 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 that continues and is disruptive, um, don't worry. I don't would worry. Like, uh, <laughs> don't worry. I thought it was other people. Don't so. worry about it. Uh, yeah. Just continue. Um, <laughs> all right. But as um, accompaniment. Yes, right. Um, mood music. Uh, uh, so, um, so, uh, so some of the other questions one might ask, rather than just what are the global global geometric properties of the flag variety, are uh, sort of what are more local uh, properties. So, like a, uh, a, a first straightforward one. Um, what does a closure of a Schubert cell look like? Um, and it is, again, a classical result of Bruja, uh, is that it is a union of uh, other Schubert cells, in particular, those indexed by permutations that are uh, less than or equal to W in what's called the Bruja order on the permutations. And if this were a combinatorics talk, 
I might say a little bit more about what Bruva order is. But on the other hand, if this were a combinatorics talk, um, uh, they probably everybody would know what Bruja order is, um, just strictly in terms of permutations. Um, but furthermore, uh, there are uh, other properties. Oh, there's a, there's a typo there. Um, so a cell is always smooth, but uh, the uh, closure of a cell, um, the Schubert variety, is smooth if and only if this permutation W avoids particular patterns. Um, and other, so other sort of geometric properties of the closures of these cells are encoded by uh, similar kinds of combinatorial uh, parameters. Um, uh, so other kinds of combinatorial properties. Um, okay, so um, back to the question. So this is sort of the way that I would pose the central question of Schubert calculus. Uh, uh, that as, as Rebecca was discussing. Um, uh, yeah, so what are these structure constants? If we take this cohomology basis of uh, Schubert classes and multiply them together and write them out in terms of Schubert classes, what exactly are the structure constants that appear? Um, so, uh, so one reason why we care, so as Rebecca said, they are intersection numbers of closures of uh, Schubert cells. Um, but they also are counting the tensor multiplicities of irreducible GLN representations. Um, and they are also counting structure constants uh, of the basis of sure functions in the ring of symmetric polynomials. Um, so, so they're really these numbers that are like really structurally uh, in, in, um, connecting uh, very different fields of mathematics. Um, uh, so having said all of that, um, Having said, I'd like, I'm not sure I will be able to concentrate if I don't actually tell them to keep it down. Um, but having said all that, I think I'm about to say uh, what Springer varieties are. Um, uh, so uh, there are sub varieties of the flag variety. Uh, I'm going to fix a linear operator. I'm really thinking of picking a matrix, an n by n matrix. Uh, and the Springer fiber of x consists of all those flags uh, for which the adjoint action of G on X is in uh, the, the algebra of the Borel, or if you want to think of it as uh, the, uh, the conjugate of X by G is upper triangular, or if you want to think of it in terms of the subspaces, the image of uh, the image of each subspace under X is contained in uh, in VI. Uh, so, for instance, if you think about the zero matrix, uh, if you work with the zero matrix, the Springer fiber of uh, the zero matrix, it's the full flag variety, um, uh, just because, say, the condition that uh, the i part of the flag, in, in this case, the i part of the flag is always sent to zero, and zero is part of every uh, subspace. Um, in general, in general, uh, this is a condition, so, so this is a condition that on some level can be analyzed pretty explicitly using linear algebra. Um, linear algebra is complicated. Um, uh, but manageable in various cases. Uh, and it can also be analyzed in some other directions. Uh, the uh, other observation is Springer fibers are a special case of uh, Hessenberg varieties, um, as was the Peterson variety from yesterday's talk. Um, so in that case, um, this condition uh, XVI contained in VI was loosened to XVI contained in VI plus one. That condition can be loosened even more if you wanted to, um, and uh, uh, and um, uh, in the Peterson case, you also pick a particular uh, linear algebra, uh, lin uh, linear operator X. Um, so, uh, so now I want to talk uh, 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 just for one second about the uh, global geometry of Springer fibers. So I'm giving us just like a little bit of a comparison, um, uh, sort of left-right comparison, uh, so we can sort of see what the uh, fly variety looks like um, and compare it to what the Springer fiber looks like. So on the one hand, the fly variety were partitioned into cells. In fact, the Springer fiber is partitioned into affine pieces. Um, uh, so by this, I mean uh, pieces that are homeomorphic to uh, uh, complex C to the D for some D. Um, in the fly variety, this gives you a CW decomposition. In the Springer fiber, this is actually just a paving by affines. Um, so uh, what that means 
uh, is um, uh, so what that means it has uh, looser uh, closure relations than a CW decomposition. Um, uh, so instead of the closure having to be a union of smaller dimensional cells, that closure can actually uh, pick up pieces of other cells. Um, however, paving by affines is still a strong enough condition so that the closures of these affine pieces of the P-thing uh, induce a basis uh, for the cohomology. Um, so this is collecting a collection of different results um, uh, from different authors. Um, now, if we try to uh, refine this, um, and uh, sort of dig into uh, more local geometry of components, uh, there is a, a lot more mysterious stuff. So for instance, um, in general, uh, we don't know what the closures uh, look like. Um, uh, we have some very <laughs> few, excuse me. <laughs> okay, so um, sorry about that. Um, so, uh, so in general, uh, we have some knowledge about what happens uh, to components, about smoothness of components. For instance, if X has two Jordan blocks, um, this is a special case uh, that we are actually going to return to. Um, and uh, also for a sort of small list of shapes of X. Uh, so the, the thinking of the Jordan blocks as giving us a partition, um, so certain types of those partitions. Um, and we really have no uh, detailed information about any uh, more refined um, uh, statements about uh, what kinds of singularities appear and so on. Um, so, uh, so having said that, uh, pretty much this right here is um, where where uh, we're going to be uh, where the rest of the talk is going to be located um, in the sort of question of what do cell closures uh, look like. Um, and it will specifically be starting with the uh, example of two Jordan blocks and then moving on uh, a little bit past that. Um, so, uh, so, oh, interesting. Um, uh, so, uh, just a few words about Springer fibers. Um, a few words about Springer fibers. So, uh, so the Jordan blocks of X give us some partition, lambda X. Uh, it's typical to draw lambda X as a Young diagram. Um, so for me, these are left aligned and top aligned collection of boxes. Uh, so they look a little bit like uh, a uh, sort of funny kind of staircase. Um, this convention is not universal. Um, uh, and what we're going to do is fill lambda bijectively with the numbers 1 through n, um, where n is the number of boxes. Uh, the filling is called row strict if the rows increase from left to right, and it's called standard if the rows increase left to right and the columns increase top to bottom. Um, so these are, um, uh, these are super common combinatorial objects. Um, I, they're also incorporating both the uh, structure of the nilpotent uh, and its Jordan blocks with the uh, permutations um, that arise in the full side variety. Um, so the theorem here is uh, basically that these cells um, are enumerated uh, by a row strict tableau. So the non-empty cells are enumerated by row strict tableaus. Um, the fillings, which number goes into which box, is more or less telling you when to add each basis vector to the flag. Um, then, moreover, the cells that have maximal dimension are enumerated by the standard tableau uh, of this particular shape. 
the dimension is coming from counting uh, certain inversions, um, but not all of the inversions uh, for most x in any case. And that's up there. Uh, uh, this, this slide, this little digression here is, uh, is, is, is here um, partly because the uh, standard tableau of a given shape count uh, something else. Um, and that's counting, they count the irreducible representations of the symmetric group Sn. Um, and in fact, uh, the, miraculously, not through any sort of obvious um, geometric action on the Springer fiber itself, uh, but the symmetric group does act naturally on the uh, cohomology of the Springer fiber. Uh, the top dimensional cohomology is irreducible um, and is the irreducible representation that corresponds to the partition into, uh, into the Jordan blocks. Um, and uh, furthermore, if you vary over all of the different nilpotent conjugacy classes for lambda, or equivalently, the different partitions of n, uh, you'll, you'll get uh, the uh, collection of irreducible representations of Sn. Um, so Springer, Springer first discovered this, uh, but it has been revisited, uh, proven in different ways, using different kinds of tools, through different lenses, generalized in some respects, um, and specialized in other respects uh, by many other people since then. And that's a part of the original motivation for uh, thinking about Springer fibers at all. So, oh, sorry, there we go. Um, so, for the next part of the talk, I am going to be thinking about NN Springer fibers uh, or two by N Springer fibers. Um, so I'm thinking about a matrix with two Jordan blocks of the same size. If I draw it as a Young diagram, it is uh, something that looks, uh, it, the Young diagram looks like that um, and has exactly two rows. So Fung, uh, Fung, to my knowledge, is the first person to think about the global structure of these particular Springer fibers, um, and uh, also to say something a little bit about the local structure. Um, so each component is homeomorphic to an iterated tower of P1 vibrations. Uh, Kavanov studied them more extensively, uh, proving that their cohomology is the center of a particular ring um, that arises when you're thinking about tangle cobordisms. Um, he uh, used a different combinatorial model for the top dimensional classes uh, that I will say something about in a second. Um, and uh, his work really prompted a lot of uh, further investigation by um, representation theorists, geometers, not theorists, um, in, in various different ways. Um, so uh, to say something about his combinatorial uh, method, hmm. I see. I'm going to say, so we want to say a couple things about matchings. Um, so uh, matchings are, you know, matchings. Um, uh, so a perfect matching, if you have a graph with n vertices, I want to pair, um, I want to pair those vertices, each of some, the half of the vertices with the other half so that everybody gets exactly one neighbor. Um, I'm going to be drawing them uh, so that the vertices are on the horizontal axis. Uh, and I'm going to put, um, I'm going to turn my edges into arcs. Uh, so uh, so uh, you'll see pictures like the ones right here. Um, furthermore, I'm actually going to be thinking about non-crossing matchings uh, in which none of these arcs cross each other. Uh, so if you want to do that um, more technically, uh, you don't have any arcs whose uh, endpoints are in interleaved uh, between each other. Um, so, uh, so it's a sort of classical result that both the standard tableau on, uh, on, on these two by n uh, diagrams are counted by Catalan numbers and the non-crossing matchings are counted by uh, Catalan numbers. So on the one hand, um, it, is, uh, it is true um, that uh, the top dimensional cells of the Springer fiber are enumerated by non-crossing matchings, um, but there's, you know, 250 other things enumerated by uh, Catalan numbers, um, and uh, so many of them are not actually particularly meaningful. Um, uh, however, 
Uh, so we developed a direct algorithm between these perfect dimensions and the top dimensional cells uh, that is, um, uh, that is uh, directly pertinent to the uh, algebra and geometry of the cells. So that's my telling you what these slides, uh, what the, this particular slide means. Um, however, uh, I think I just want to say what the takeaway is, and the takeaway is there's a there's a direct way of writing what these slides look like, and this is really the thing that I want to show you rather than uh, showing you all the words. Um, uh, that essentially, um, when you look at what the top dimensional cells look like in the two by n Springer fiber, when n equals three here, for instance, these free variables will show up in certain kinds of uh, sort of uh, nested or triangular patterns. Um, so here, for instance, is one of these sort of up, these nestings or uh, sort of lower triangular patterns. Um, and there are a couple others of them. Um, when you see those free variables appearing, um, each of those variables corresponds to an arc. Uh, as the variables start uh, nesting in the matrix, uh, the arcs will start uh, nesting in the non-crossing matching. So here, this is the description of what happens um, in, this, in this algorithm. A corresponds to the red arcs, B corresponds to the blue arcs, C corresponds to the yellow arcs. Uh, Uh, so that actually only tells us about the top dimensional cases. Um, uh, Russell described uh, Russell described uh, topologically um, uh, the the um, the right analogy. So she just proved proved uh, how to sort of think about the other cells. Uh, instead of thinking about non-crossing matchings, um, so, so since we sort of think about these components as being an iterated tower of P1 vibrations, um, as you start uh, getting into smaller and smaller pieces and sort of smaller uh, homology pieces, uh, you're kind of pulling, pulling apart the P1s um, and turning some of them into rays. Uh, and uh, so, so this is just a slight modification of um, what what uh, uh, she proved uh, indexes the lower dimensional cells. Um, it's a non-crossing partial matching with some rays. And what makes uh, a, so, so we're gonna call them standard non-crossing partial matching. If, uh, if none of the rays are below arcs, so rays can only be, uh, um, uh, rays can only be in places that have no arc above them, uh, and also there should be an even, even number of rays overall. So those are the two uh, band situations. Uh, and here are some examples of some standard non-crossing partial matchings. Even number of rays, none of them below an arc. Uh, so having said this, um, uh, the next slide simply says that the, uh, the direct, so these uh, standard non-crossing partial matchings um, in a natural way, index the cells of the Springer fiber, um, where again, I, I'm not so interested in the simple fact that they index the cells of the Springer fiber, um, but rather that the nesting structure um, and the fact of whether or not there's a ray or an arc in a particular location is telling you about which, uh, which entries are free and what variable they have and uh, whether, um, uh, uh, and so on. So here's, um, here are all of the cells for the Springer, the two by two Springer fiber uh, with their arc diagrams. And there are all of the cells for the two by three uh, Springer fiber with their uh, uh, non-crossing partial matchings. Um, and, uh, uh, and uh, we're going to, oh, and, and, uh, and I think I, I was um, a little uh, loose 
uh, playing a little fast and loose with my description of the algorithm. Um, it is, we have a, an algorithm, the algorithm goes back and forth. Um, I, and uh, this just sort of describes uh, the flow chart for uh, how you decide if you, if you have a uh, uh, non-crossing partial matching, how you would decide which matrix to create. Um, and so it's fully automatizable um, process. Uh, so, um, so I said at the beginning um, that we were interested in looking at closures of cells uh, and the uh, basic strategy is uh, roughly like this. So the full torus of the flag variety does not act in spring root fibers, just as it doesn't act in general on the Peterson variety or on any Hessenberg variety. Uh, however, various smaller uh, tori do. Um, assuming for a second that X is in Jordan canonical form, uh, there is a subtorus that has uh, T, T squared, T cubed all along the diagonal that acts. Um, there's another subtorus that's constant on Jordan blocks um, that also acts. I could rephrase both of these conditions more generally uh, in terms of Lie theory, um, but uh, I need to say it directly so that um, so it's really clear uh, what objects I'm talking about. Um, so, so sort of interesting thing, the first torus is rank one, but it's generic in the sense that it has the same fixed point set as the full torus. The second torus uh, a priori maybe seems bigger, but uh, its orbits are much less useful uh, than the full torus. Um, so a couple of remarks uh, that I would add. First, uh, this uh, choice, uh, this is obviously like this. The, uh, I have uh, assumed a particular choice of X in its conjugacy class um, it, it, in order to use this particular torus. Uh, the statement, the general statements are, you know, given any X, there is certainly a uh, rank one torus that is generic in the sense that I described above. There is a, a priori, you know, higher ranked torus uh, with a different sort of orbit structure. Um, uh, but it depends on essentially your choice of basis. Um, uh, I think another observation, even though we have sort of moved into generally talking about these rectangular and even two row uh, tableau, these where I act on uh, Springer fibers um, for arbitrary, uh, uh, arbitrary X. Um, the things stated on this particular slide only, they don't matter so that you have some Jordan canonical form. Um, uh, so there are some other Lie types in which, uh, in particular, that first subtorus uh, would um, be not possible. Um, so uh, finally, if you just look at the cells, you can find larger torus actions. And the strategy of uh, what we did uh, next was just simply to use that um, really sort of in some by hand calculations uh, to identify the boundaries of the cells. Um, sorry, I'm like trying and having a little technical moment here. That might work. Okay. Um, so, uh, so, uh, so we do, we can say more about what these, uh, what the closures of these cells are. In fact, um, we can give a really, uh, clear combinatorial description, um, if, it's a typo, if one arc has another arc nested immediately above, I'm going to call the higher arc its parent. Uh, and in principle, what I want to do to create closures is I will cut an arc um, and then reattach the endpoints of that arc to the endpoints of its parent. Uh, so taking, uh, if you have a parent, I'm going to take you and your nested parent um, nested pair of arcs and then uh, change it to be two unnested arc with the same endpoints. Moreover, I'm going to label them both with the same variable. If I cut an arc that doesn't have a parent, I just get two rays. Uh, now I'm just adding some like technical details. If I cut an arc without a parent that has fewer rays on one side than the other, then instead I create an arc labeled zero. Uh, and if the parent of an arc labeled zero is cut, then, uh, then this sort of descends. Um, so what this looks like in particular, um, this is effectively the uh, process of letting um, particular variables go to zero or sort of analyzing the action 
uh, of um, uh, smaller tori and smaller uh, torus flows on on uh, these uh, cells. So uh, here is one example where I have these two unnested arcs. I can cut the left arc and that just turns it into two rays. I can cut the right arc and that turns it into two rays. I can cut both arcs. Um, and here, uh, when I cut both arcs, I end up with this one uh, arc in the middle that, um, that technically is labeled zero. All right, here's another example. I have two nested arcs. Uh, so in this case, I can uh, cut the top arc. Uh, so this is the arc labeled A. And just, I am left, I, that becomes two. <laughs> um, I didn't know that you could see all of my cat. Um, uh, so, uh, so, so, so the top arc becomes two rays. Um, in the second case, if you cut the bottom arc, uh, I reattach the nesting to uh, the two, uh, sort of uh, just take the same four endpoints, but uh, instead of arranging it as a nested arc, I make it an unnested arc, and I have those two variables A. Uh, so now, uh, this sort of interesting thing happens. Um, I mean, it sort of keep eliminating variables um, in, in this process, uh, and uh, uh, sort of both uh, interestingly, but um, uh, potentially problematically, it looks like I have um, uh, it looks like I have these five cells. Um, why I say that's problematic is because I happen to know that all of the components um, should be some uh, iterated tower of P1 vibrations. So I actually know that they should have uh, Betty numbers. Of you know two to the two to the two to the uh, uh, n, um, and this looks like five, not four. Uh, so I'm just going to pause for one second. Of course, you're free to blurt out um, if you see uh, something that might resolve this issue, um, <laughs> but uh, uh, but I'm not going to assume that anybody uh, uh, anybody will say uh, any particular thing. Uh, I'm just going to pause for a second, though, to let you observe, um, because in fact, uh, there is there is a, 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 there, there is a trick, um, and the trick is this: uh, if you look at this cell in the bottom right, um, this cell in the bottom right is uh, so the cell in the bottom right. That's a, that's a zero that I drew poorly. Um, so the cell in the bottom right is actually just a subset of the cell in the uh, top left corner there. Um, so there's really actually, even, even though a priori, it looked like we created five cells, um, we actually only have four distinct cells and we're getting to one sort of slice um, in, in two particular different ways. Um, so this is obviously, this is, this is why paving by affines, uh, this is an example of how paving by affines are just weirder than CW complexes. Um, because they have these uh, these strange sorts of closure relations. So, uh, so uh, more generally, uh, more generally, what's going on here is the following. Um, uh, fact, right? Uh, so, if you cut a child arc before its parent, um, you you so so cutting a child arc before its parent is really what was problematic in that previous example. Um, if you do that, you produce a subset of a cell obtained by cutting in generational order. Um, uh, so uh, so I'd say that's a fact ish because um, uh, we don't have a completely formal proof of that, um, but we have a really convincing. Uh, argument for it and a lot of data in support of it. Um, so, so consequence, fortunately, um, these uh, closure relations that we've uh, described here are actually uh, matching up with um, what we believe from what we know about the uh, overall structure of the components. Now, the big picture of all of this, the big picture is that um, uh, so in this sort of uh, goal of finding closures of cells, um, the, uh, the sort of relevant uh, combinatorial object here is uh, these non-crossing matchings. Um, and the closure of cells is really sort of governed or determined by this nesting and unnesting. Uh, 
so so uh, so so uh, what do I want to say? I, I think I feel like I want to impress on this point just a little bit more. Um, you know, part of what kind of tells us that the combinatorics of the permutations is like really important for the flag variety is that they are encoding uh, other deep structural properties. Um, and uh, it's sort of natural to want to find that in Young Tableau and want to find similar uh, similar sorts of encodings about Young Tableau for things like splinter fibers. Um, but I feel like uh, this is sort of just like some evidence that they're just the wrong combinatorial way to look at them. Um, the, so, so the young tableau are not the best combinatorial way to think about closures. Um, that instead, this nesting and unnesting is and is is uh, it is a, gives you a natural partial order and um, uh, yeah, it's just it's the right better thing to do. Um, so, all right, so this is all for the two by n Springer fibers, the two row Springer fibers. What can we say um, in more generality? Uh, so the first statement is that the right generalization, like obviously there's lots of ways of generalizing non-crossing matchings. Um, the right generalization, generalization in this context is uh, webs, at least I believe uh, that would seem to be the right thing to do here. Um, so. Um, loosely speaking, both because I'm getting close to being out of time and because this would take us far afield um, from the topic, um, but webs are the morphisms in a diagrammatic category for quantum SLK representations. Uh, so sort of informally, uh, so that the category itself is the spider category and the webs are the uh, morphisms. Each web is a particular kind of graph with boundary. When k equals two, and we're dealing with the two by n Springer fiber, we're getting uh, the uh, non-crossing matchings that we saw before. The boundary vertices represent vector spaces, the edges within each web, and the ways that they intersect, um, which they do for general k, but that describes the intertwining of tensor powers of those vector spaces. And then the sort of algebraic reductions that you might perform on the representation correspond to scheme theoretic reductions on the diagram. And so I think I sort of promised, uh, or mentally I promised to return a little bit to Kavanov's work uh, later um, uh, in this talk. And this is, I think, where I'm going to uh, revisit it for a second. Um, so non-crossing matchings um, in the context, you know, from Kavanov's point of view, uh, he was thinking about the temporary leave algebra, um, which is another thing that non-crossing matchings essentially are. Uh, so, um, uh, where you can uh, uh, compose non-crossing matchings by essentially gluing them together, um, and 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 that's the kind of structure uh, that he was thinking about um, when he started looking at the cohomology of the Springer fiber. Uh, it's also why not theorists, in particular, have been interested in webs and through webs in Springer fibers. Uh, so, uh, so. So I think I'm going to finish up with a little bit more about uh, k by n uh, Springer fibers. Um, so three by n Springer fibers are uh, and webs for SL3 are reasonably well understood. Uh, so they have their the irreducible webs. So the basis of these webs has a concise uh, global definition. By global, I just mean something like uh, that I could write down a set of criteria and you could test whether a web was uh, 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 reducible or not um, versus giving you a collection of reductions and saying, well, keep going until the web is as simple as you can make it. Um, so Cooperberg uh, gives that um, characterization of irreducible webs. Um, moreover, there's a bijection between standard three by n Young diagrams and irreducible webs that comes from Kovanov and Cooperberg. Uh, and, um, uh, so uh, a lot less is known about three by n Springer fibers. Uh, so with Mickey McGill, uh, we've constructed an explicit bijection between reduced webs and the top dimensional cells of the three by n Springer fiber, uh, and uh, uh, but sort of uh, argued with myself about exactly which words I should be using here. But um, uh, so that deals with the top dimensional pieces of the three by n. Springer fiber. Um, uh, we have a mechanism 
uh, 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 to create uh, the smaller dimensional analogs of uh, the webs, in this case, so sort of the standard dotted webs. Um, perhaps we might use the analog of the standard non-crossing partial matchings, um, as well as a sort of heuristic to generalize the bijection between uh, cells and webs to the lower dimensional cells. Um, and we're hoping that we can get some uh, traction on the closure question. Uh, so, uh oh. Ha! All right. Um, so, uh, so I think I'm going to just uh, end with an open question, uh, which is about K by M Springer fibers and uh, sort of for more general K. Um, so, uh, when K is greater than or equal to four, there actually is not a closed form description of reduced webs. Um, uh, the, you know, the best the best we can say is really just use the reductions and 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 get get small. Um, uh, so um, one one sort of guiding philosophy here is that I'd say the um, the uh, experimental work. Uh, some of the we've 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 collected some data that suggests that the combinatoric symptomology of Springer fibers may actually help choose a sort of good family of reduced webs. I mean, I think I'd say the guiding the guiding philosophy here is that actually the kinds of pictures that you end up drawing when you draw webs uh, describe the structure of the cells of Springer fibers um, and the kinds of reductions that are natural to do. If you're thinking about uh, uh, graphs with, um, uh, if you're thinking about graphs with uh, nesting and structure, um, that those 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 things are related to the geometry of Springer fibers. Um, so in this case, um, we think that both uh, there's this philosophy that um, once you get greater so through in two by n Springer fibers and three by n Springer fibers, we learn a lot about the geometry of Springer fibers by considering the webs. Um, but uh, the part of the open question here is perhaps information that we can deduce about uh, Springer fibers may help us also um, gain more information about webs. Uh, so I think I am going to stop there. Thank you, everybody, and thank you for your patience. Thank you, Juliana. Let's all uh, unmute. Thank you.